Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's U Miami Health Talk, Food, Mind and Movement as Medicine. It seems to be a very popular topic that's very much top of the mind for so many of us, especially at the new year. I'm health journalist, Ileana Bravo. I'm gonna be your moderator for tonight's talk. And of course it's presented by U Health Virtual Clinics. There's so many of you out there, hundreds of you who have signed up for this and we really welcome you tonight because remember U Health expert providers are ready to care for you in our facilities, virtually, wherever you are. And most importantly, we invite you to learn about the measures we have in place to keep you safe in our facilities, as well as your appointment scheduling options. Please visit umiamihealth.org and see what your choices are. Well, tonight we're excited because we're going to hear from three University of Miami Health System experts, Dr. Michelle Perlman, Ms. Flora Beth Arat, and Mr. Christopher Fitzmorris. A question and answer session is going to take place at the end of their presentation to answer questions that many of you have already submitted in advance, but there's no problem, you have time. You can still ask the experts questions as we go along using the anonymous Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Take a moment on your computer or whatever device you're using to locate that now, little bubbles that say Q&A. You'll enter your questions as you think of them, we'll prepare them for our panelists to address at the end. And our experts will also be asking you some questions. So please be prepared to respond and be informed. Now I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michelle Perlman, an assistant professor in digestive and liver diseases at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She's a gastroenterologist and physician nutrition specialist, board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology and obesity medicine. Her mission is to educate the community on the fundamentals of wellness and nutrition, and she collaborates closely with specialists in bariatrics, hepatology, endocrinology, sleep medicine, sports medicine, oncology, and dietetics to provide comprehensive care to patients with nutritional issues. We're so pleased to have you tonight, Dr. Perlman. Welcome. And we're going to begin with the first poll question. Remember, we told you to be prepared to be asked. Well, here you go. First question, have you ever struggled with getting to or maintaining a healthy weight? Dr. Perlman is going to be at the ready to give us her ideas and her reaction to this yes or no response. Have you ever struggled with getting to or maintaining a healthy weight? I think we can all relate to this one at different times of our lives and certainly during the pandemic and all the challenges and difficulties. And the answer is overwhelmingly, Dr. Perlman, I think as we expected, 77% say yes, they have. All right, thank you, Ileana. Good evening, everyone. I'm honored and privileged to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you all tonight about something I'm extremely passionate about. During most of my training, I learned how to properly evaluate patients, make diagnoses, and offer treatments, many of which involved medications, procedures, or surgeries. I believe that although these management strategies have a key role in the treatment of both acute and chronic medical conditions, but I have now dedicated my career to treating and educating the community and my peers on the benefits of proper nutrition to not only prevent disease, but to treat disease. Whether you're interested in losing weight, gaining weight, or maintaining your weight, I truly believe that if you wanna feel well, you have to eat well, not just today, but every day. Tonight, we aim to provide you with the tools that will change the way you think about food, the mind, and movement. We will try to answer as many of your questions, but we'll defer more personal health questions to private consultations. I would not be able to practice my mission if it weren't for having the opportunity to work at the University of Miami, where I work and collaborate with so many wonderful people who share this vision. From registered dietitians to exercise physiologists, mental health providers, primary care providers, and numerous subspecialties. My mission is to educate the community on the fundamentals of wellness and nutrition, to support and develop successful and affordable approaches to the prevention and treatment of obesity and its associated diseases, and to do this with accessible, innovative, and comprehensive care using a multidisciplinary approach. 
Although I am a fellowship trained gastroenterologist, my practice is now dedicated towards weight management, which includes medical nutritional therapy, pharmacotherapy, endobariatrics, pre and post bariatric care. Obesity is a disease and should be evaluated and treated aggressively. Through my time as a practicing gastroenterologist, I've realized that addressing nutrition and helping people maintain a healthy weight is essential for some of the most common gastrointestinal disorders that I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's heartburn, Barrett's esophagus, esophageal cancer, gallstones, gallbladder cancer, colon polyps, colon cancer, and fatty liver, you name it, all of these conditions are affected by nutrition, weight, and exercise. Now, unfortunately, weight loss is not that simple. It's not just about cutting calories, moving more, using diet drinks and artificial sweeteners in order to lose weight. It is far more complicated. And the problem is, is that in the digital age, there is so much information that people just don't know what is true, what to believe, um, what is fiction, what is nonfiction. And so I get these questions all the time. Is fat bad? Are carbs the enemy? How much is too much protein? Should I do keto or what about intermittent fasting? These are questions I get on a daily basis, multiple times per day. Fad diets are extremely common and they are quick weight loss plans that promise quick results and often are so restrictive and they are really only temporary and they are just not sustainable. And I have so many patients that have lost 20, 30, 40, 50, even upwards of 100 pounds eight different times. And so really the challenge here is not just losing the weight, but the challenge is actually losing the weight in a healthy manner without developing disordered eating habits and then maintaining that weight while still having a resemblance of some quality of life and being able to do the things that you wanna do. These are some infamous moments in dieting history. Some of my favorites are the Sleeping Beauty diet, where people will take sedatives and sleep the whole weekend so that they don't eat. Um, other common or not so common ones, people will actually take parasites in capsules to cause a malabsorption syndrome. Um, and then some of the more common branded ones like Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, I would have to admit that I'm guilty of doing the grapefruit diet and the cabbage soup diet. Um, and so people are clearly desperate um, to try to find the perfect diet plan. Um, but if there were a perfect diet plan, there wouldn't be hundreds and even thousands of diets on the market. Um, and so trying to figure out like, not a diet, but really using this term, a nutritional plan, a lifestyle plan um, is really the way to go. When we mention terms like diet, that really connotes a finite amount of time. So things like the Whole30, people say, I'm gonna go on this plan for 30 days, and then I'm gonna reintroduce some of my old eating habits and they notoriously gain the weight back. So these are not finite diets. These are lifestyle changes where we can allow you to experiment with food to help you figure out what's gonna help you in the long term. So I use food as medicine. When we talk about normal physiologic food reactions, many times our body is actually trying to protect ourselves from some of the disordered eating habits that we've um, learned or that we um, kind of have been trained to think are normal. Starting from when we're babies, we're literally told when we should eat, what we should eat, and how much we should eat. When we go through school, we're given you know, breakfast in the morning before school. We're told when we have to have lunch and how much time we have to eat it. We get snack time in the afternoon and then it's dinner and then maybe some ice cream before bed or cookies and milk. And so these eating habits are ingrained in our brain from when we are babies. And so the problem is, is that people often are never actually taught what true hunger feels like. We think we're hungry, but many times we're not hungry for true food we're hungry for something and whether that's companionship or whether that's movement or stress reduction, um, we, we often tend to confuse those signals. And so when people feel poorly after eating certain food, after eating certain foods, many times it's our body trying to tell us maybe we need to make adjustments. Maybe what we think are normal eating behaviors are not so normal. So eating large amounts of food, uh, our stomach gets distended, we can regurgitate. Um, fatty foods like fried foods delay gastric emptying and ultramotility, and that can cause nausea and pain. 
foods that have high FODMAPs, certain carbohydrates that produce gas molecules will cause bloating and in some people diarrhea. A lot of diet food products are rampant with artificial sweeteners and sugar alcohols, and those can cause a lot of GI symptoms like bloating and diarrhea. And it is actually normal to pass gas. That is a normal physiologic process. So truly trying to figure out and differentiating between normal eating behaviors and abnormal, and what is our body trying to tell our brain as far as maybe our eating behaviors um, need to make some adjustments. Um, and so if you want to feel well, you have to eat well. What I harp on all the time is that it's not just about what you eat, but how you eat and how much you eat is just as important. Healthy eating varies from person to person. Just because an item contains nutrients does not mean it's gonna be healthy for you or allow you to feel well. Food allergies and intolerances can develop at any age and your body changes from a day-to-day -day basis. Just like everything else in our life changes, whether it's stress, anxiety, surgery, antibiotics, medications, our nutrition as we age has to be just as dynamic. And so the, the, honestly, one of my favorite parts about what I do in clinic is I get to teach grown adults how to eat. So it's extremely fun, but it's also extremely challenging. I have to try to change 50, 60, 70, 80 years worth of sometimes very poor eating behaviors. Um, and so that can be a challenge. But if people are able to make progress, not perfect changes, no one has to be perfect, but making progress and making better choices can make a huge difference. And so little things like avoiding straws, eating slowly, oftentimes I'm guilty of myself, we inhale our food, not uh, talking while eating, um, swallowing tons of air, making sure we're not going to a midnight buffet on a cruise and then going to bed right after. And then we'll talk more about exercising regularly and stress management. So what do I do as a gastroenterologist, but with a specialized specialization in obesity management? I focus mostly on medical nutritional therapy. I also offer pharmacotherapy or medications, endobariatrics, and I work very closely with our uh, bariatric colleagues. The struggle is real. How do I meet someone for the first time, establish rapport to discuss a sensitive topic, learn about their comorbid conditions, about their failed prior weight loss attempts, coping strategies, family unit, support system, budget, time constraints, food preferences, allergies, and then teach people the basics of nutrition, what is added sugar, natural sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and then counsel them on realistic goals all in 40 minutes. I know that's a mouthful. I'm exhausted just talking about it. But yes, it is possible. And I, I really try to form a partnership with my patients. And it is nothing that I can completely take care of during the first visit. But that's what the follow-up visits are for. And close communication is figuring out how we can tackle all of these to have a good outcome. So my approach is a personalized one. I have no agenda when I go into clinic. I don't give anyone any set diet. My goal is to really understand what medical problems they have, what their preferences are, what do they like to eat, not like to eat, their GI symptoms, and then we develop a plan together. In general, we wanna avoid or limit liquids with sugar, added sugar, added salt, and avoid trans fats. And then again, depending on the person, there's a lot of nuances. And then we kind of get into the weeds on what that plan would look like for each individual person. So we cannot skip over the lifestyle modification that includes not diet, but really dietary changes along with exercise. And then for those who qualify, then we offer medication options as well as endobariatrics. Without the fundamental uh, lifestyle modification, the bottom of the pyramid, we cannot skip over that and go on to the medications or the surgery um, because they just don't work long term without the fundamentals. So all of these things in combination really help to have long term positive outcomes. Medications, I'm not going to really talk about these. We have six on the market that are FDA approved to help people lose weight. And again, they are tools that can be very helpful. And then endobariatrics, these are for patients with a BMI of 30 to 40 with some but not significant comorbid conditions. Unfortunately, it's not covered by insurance currently, but these balloons, we basically place them endoscopically. We uh, 
in input about 500 cc's of saline. That balloon remains in the stomach for about six months. And what it does is it causes you to feel full. And so it's really best for people who eat. They feel full, but then they feel hungry soon after. And it allows for people to cut down their calories, but not feel um, extreme levels of hunger. And then we also offer the endoscopic sleeve, which is basically a sleeve gast uh, gastroplasty, but via endoscopy. This is what it looks like with the balloon. Um, and so overall, obesity is a disease and we should really treat it as such very aggressively. We cannot just tell people that they need to cut their calories, move more, we'll see you back in six months. And if you don't lose weight, we're gonna put you on medication. There are so many options in between the fad diet and going for surgery. And that's really what U Health has to offer. Um, obesity is associated with so many GI symptoms and conditions. We want to start where you are. It's not about being perfect, but it's about making progress. And our treatment options include dietary counseling, a nutrition plan, not a diet, increasing activity is tolerated, and Chris is going to talk more about those options, medications, endobariatrics, and working with our bariatric colleagues. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Perlman. And that, that uh, slide of yours with all the fad diets, I, we had to look closely to see how many we had all tried, sadly. <laughs> um, all right, I remind you all that you have an opportunity to ask questions of our experts. Remember the Q&A little box at the bottom of your Zoom screen located and go ahead and bring those in. But now it's our next speaker, Ms. Flora Beth Arat who is a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist, and hypnotist in the Division of Digestive and Liver Diseases at UHealth, University of Miami Health System. She thrives on helping others understand the mental power we possess and our innate capacity to direct our actions, which can lead to improved health. Welcome, Ms. Arat. Thank you so much. It's my privilege being here with you. And we can't wait to hear some of your great tips. And right away, we're going to launch our second poll question, which she has suggested. And that is, do you engage in any of these activities? You can select all that apply to you. It's a multiple choice. Eating meals while using a computer or smartphone or watching TV. Going outdoors for lunch break. Eating late at night. And skip breakfast. How many of these do you engage in? And I am sure that um, some of us are guilty of at least one or two of these. And uh, Flora Betharat is going to tell us how to help ourselves and how to avoid some of these patterns or habits. That's right. <laughs> it is, like I said, my privilege to be here and we are going to learn a lot today. So and there's already uh, the, the answers. So. 84% like to eat in front of their computer or TVs. And 46% eat late at night. That's another, another little problem. So go to it, Ms. Arat, please. <laughs> Thank you once again. So see, I wanted to go ahead and start by saying that is very common, especially now with the pandemic, that some of us have to be working from home and it's very tempting that we are just, you know, sitting in front of the computer and try to, you know, get the work done and also eating at the same time. So, but it's very important for us to just be mindful and being, um, you know, more into tune of our emotions and our feelings into that moment. Like for instance, are you distracted while you eat? Do you eat more meals quickly? Do you still feel hungry after finishing a meal? Or do you recall what you ate for lunch yesterday? So, or perhaps we can just eat more when we're feeling stressed, worried, bored, depressed. If you do, that's, that's okay because you're not alone. You see, my name again is Florida Rao. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm a psychotherapist and a hypnotist. And today we're gonna learn, like Dr. Michelle Alperman was saying, the mental health techniques to help you eat healthier and the other um, activities that we're gonna be able to implement every day to help you lose weight, okay? But first I wanted to start by explaining a little bit about the brain gut axis, okay? You see the brain and the gut or the intestines, they communicate with each other, okay? And they are continually 
through nerves and chemical signals, signals to um, the brain and the gut. So it's very important for us to be mindful and understand this communication, okay? The intent intestines send frequent messages to the brain to let the brain know about their condition. For example, when we are getting pulled from a meal or when we have to go to the bathroom because of a bowel movement, okay? So now we have a lot of evidence-based techniques that we can start implementing right away. The first one is cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness meditation, diaphragmatic breathing, relaxation exercises, mindfulness eating, which is one of my favorites, and clinical hypnosis. But what exactly is CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy? It means that our thoughts will influence our emotions, our feelings, and therefore our behaviors. For instance, if we are thinking, oh, tomorrow I have the surgery, I don't know what is going to be the outcome, immediately those chemicals that we are here in the brain, they communicate here to the gut. And we will have like stomach pain, what they call um, butterflies in the stomach, or maybe some of us will have even diarrhea. So again, because of that communication between the brain and the gut is so important, okay? So with cognitive behavioral therapy, we're able to identify those thoughts first and then go ahead and change it from negative to positive, okay? So CBT, it will help you to promote healthier mealtime habits by helping the persons to be more into tune into their bodies. And perhaps is it that we're feeling stressed, tired, or bored? Mindfulness meditation. A lot of my patients, they feel, and they said, wow, it's so hard for me to just, you know, shut down all of my thoughts. Actually, that is not the purpose of mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness meditation is, like it says here in the definition, awareness cultivated by paying attention in a sustained and a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non judgmental. Okay? So, as you can see here in this image, is your mind full or are you practicing mindfulness? This is like, like I was saying, one of my favorites, mindfulness eating. This is a technique that you can go ahead and start implementing today. It is a proven means to help eat less. In some studies, up to 50% less, okay? It entitles or engages all of your senses, okay? As you see here in this picture, we have this person having like an apple here on her hand. So with mindfulness eating is paying attention of what you are eating without judging yourself for what has happened in the past or what will happen in the future. In other words, without judging yourself when you are not making a lot of, of good choices when it comes to food, okay? So again, not being judgmental. So it involves your senses. So as you see in this picture again, so if you imagine that you have an apple on your hand, okay? So we're going to utilize the sense of vision. What is it that you see on that apple? What is the color? What is the, the shape? And what is the size, okay? So again, you're involving all of the senses. Then the sense of touch. So you're going to go ahead and touch that apple. Yes, it sounds strange, but it really works. So how does it feel with your right hand? How does it feel with the left hand? Does it have a texture? Is it, you know, a rough a surface? Whatever those things that you're able to touch in that moment, you can go ahead and verbalize it and say it out loud, not only in your mind, out loud, okay? And then we have the sense of smell. So you're going to go ahead and smell that apple and then say it out loud. What is the sensation that you're able to smell? What is the smell that you're able to recognize? Is it sweet? Is it sour? Whatever the smell is, you can go ahead and say it out loud. And then the sense of taste. When you are eating that apple, just take your time and really, really go ahead and chew it and slowly. When you have that first piece of apple on your mouth, just go ahead and try to experience all of the flavors, the sensations. How does it feel when it comes from your mouth to the esophagus, from the esophagus to the stomach, okay? So as you can see, doing this mindfulness eating exercise will help you to reduce the stress, 
while also improving the pleasure of the dining experience. It's judgment free, awareness of your thoughts, emotions, and the sensory experiences. It helps to pay attention to a task that we don't stop to notice. So again, we have to chew our food thoroughly. Eating too quickly is not healthy. Eating as slowly triggers hormones that help digestion. Food cravings. Maybe our cravings are indicating that we're stressed, tired, uncomfortable, angry, frustrated. So perhaps we need to start asking ourselves, well, is it a physical hunger that I'm experiencing right now? Or is it emotional hunger? There's a difference. So we have to, again, first kind of, you know, set our thoughts into the moment before you make the decision of eating something, okay? Um, and how do we manage it? Well, we have to focus on adapting a behavior that it does not involve eating. Like for example, you can go for a walk or you can use um, you yoga or take a nap, get exercise, okay? Or practice meditation. This is another of my favorite techniques that we use, um, clinical hypnosis. And let me just say that hypnosis is not what we see on TV where they will make you do these silly things that you have to, you know, move your arms and pretend that you are a bird. No, that is actually <coughs> a stage hypnosis, okay? That's not we're going, what we're going to be doing um, here in the clinic. It is clinical hypnosis in which we're going to be able to work with the subconscious mind to help us decreasing the sugar cravings or decreasing the anxiety. Um, and, and again, it's super, super interested, interesting in it's very evidence-based. 98% of the population can be hypnotized. All hypnosis is self-hypnosis. The hypnotist, like myself, will not do anything to you. You will do it on your own and you will be awake the whole time. It's not that you that they're gonna make you fall asleep. No, it's not. It's just like I said, being in this state of deep relaxation that your subconscious mind is open for the, any of the suggestions, okay? So what is clinical hypnosis? Again, it is the bypassing of critical awareness of the mind. We do hypnosis in our own every single day. Let me give you an example. When you are driving your car, you think about a lot of things. However, you don't start thinking about how to drive your car. That is a perfect example of hypnosis. The second example is that if you are watching a movie and then you get swept away into the movie, if the main character cries, you cry. If the main character is happy, you get happy. So you see, we're just, you know, in that state that even though everything that we see in that movie is fake, we are still able to believe it. Okay. So that's an example of hypnosis. Hypnotherapy, the use of hypnosis as a tool to help the mind. Again, we use a lot of deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, relaxation exercises, guided imagery or visualization progressive muscle relaxation techniques. It must be performed by a licensed mental health professional. So what are the strategies? Well, in general terms, we have to reserve eating just for eating. Distracted eating, it will lead us to be indulging, okay? Number two, we have to sit down to eat our meals. I would prefer for you guys to be eating on the, you know, by the table. So that way your brain has that kind of, you know, break and say, okay, even though if I'm working from home, I'm still able to just during lunchtime, stand up, go to the kitchen table and start having your meal. Number three, before you begin to eat, take a few seconds to calm your mind down, okay? And how do we do that? By practicing deep breathing relaxation exercises, okay? Number four, eat slowly. Number five, be conscious of portion control. Begin to eat with a positive and joyful attitude. Recall in your mind's eye what you ate at the previous feeding, okay? Never go back for seconds for at least 20 minutes after your first bite of food. 
when you feel full, again, that connection between the brain and the gut. Pull your fork down and pause to prevent overeating. Number 10, associate your food and connect with the people with whom you are sharing the meal. And this is my last quote, one of my favorite uh, psychoanalysts, that's Carl Jung, that says, I am not what happened to me, I am what I choose to become. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Arat, and uh, such useful information. I mean, who thought that eating fast or, or not calming your mind or getting yourself centered before you sit down with a plate of food was so critical. Thank you so very much. And um, by the way, a lot of you in the Q&A chat are asking whether this webinar tape is going to be available later. And the answer is yes, it's going to be emailed to all of you attendees about a week uh, later. So a week from now, give or take, you can receive this webinar. So thank you so much for paying attention so closely. Now let's um, welcome our final presenter of the evening, Mr. Christopher Fitzmorris, an exercise physiologist and health coach at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Miami, who leads community exercise programs at the UM Wellness Centers. He creates exercise programs for people living with cancer and his mission is to keep our community active and inspired to move at every age. Now, Chris himself has a very personal and inspirational health story. He was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and encephalomyelitis at age five. And guess what? He used exercise to overcome a challenging childhood. So, so great to have you with us tonight, Chris. We're going to launch right into the last two poll questions of the evening, which he submitted. So here we go. Question number one, since the lockdown of the pandemic, has your time spent in exercise increased or decreased? There are your choices, increased, decreased, not changed at all, or I don't exercise. Obviously the lockdown was a time where we never expected to happen and we were locked up in our homes and suddenly, um, and depressed, and anxious, and uptight, and suddenly exercise perhaps took a back seat. So let's see how we did. And the response is 37% hmm, increase, 43% decrease, kind of almost 50-50 on that. That's very interesting. So let's go right into your second poll question is, has your weight increased or decreased since the onset of the pandemic? And that is, there it is, increased, decreased, or has our weight stayed the same? Since the lockdown, how has our weight done? Increased, decreased, stay the same. We ate more, maybe we had more time, however, to exercise more. So I'll be curious to see what the answer is here as Chris then weighs in and starts his presentation. There you go, Chris, what do you think? 40% said the weight went up. Wow, well, for, just for the record, this is the first time I've ever given a presentation with um, tears about to come out of my eyes. Uh, just uh, that opening, just uh, amazing. But um, anyways, um, back back to business. Um, uh, so. Yeah, no. Um, um, the first the first question was kind of uh, um, surprising. Um, it, it's it's interesting that you know both um, um, the levels of physical activity levels have has increased um, for some people and and decreased for uh, for others. Um, it's really really interesting, and I'll explain more about it. Um, but coming to my uh, to the second poll question, it's um, it's definitely no surprise uh, to me, and that's like one of the big topics um, uh, that I'm going to be discussing. Uh, within this presentation, how um, exercise and and COVID um, um, affected the masses. So, let me just uh, go to the next slide here. So, um, yeah. So, pretty much, this is kind of a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, um, the big and the the big factor of how COVID has affected all these different uh, uh, factors here. Um, you know, especially with it, with only having you know um, fit, um, a short period of time to talk about really really big topics here, I, I'm not going to really deep too deep into them, but I'm really going to kind of um, clear up the uh, the relationship between 
all of them, just basically how physical activity plays a role, um, how it affects obesity, um, you know, um, weight loss, and, and, and overall how um, it affects our psychological health, our, our mental health. So going on. So, so pretty much um, when it comes to obesity, when you, when you look at um, um, how obesity and COVID uh, together, you're, you're just, you're just um, enhancing all these other factors that, that are, um, that are um, playing into our bodies, such as um, increasing our immune function, um, you're increasing the in inflammation. Um, and if you notice the green boxes, you're looking at all these different um, uh, risk factors or, or these, um, um, these um, factors that come into play. You know, we can't control our age um, and psych psychological distress can somewhat be mediated or um, uh, modified for, but physical activity, you can immediately, you know, um, uh, have an effect on that. You can either get more or less, and it's going to have a huge um, outcome, like in those um, factors there. And um, coming to this next slide, this kind of reinforces how obesity and COVID just by itself has a huge astronom astronomical effect, specifically, um, you know, obesity increases the risk of all these other uh, comorbidities, uh, whether it comes from uh, diabetes, heart disease. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And just with all these other comorbidities, you increase the risk of getting COVID. And just by default, when you when you do get sick and when you are uh, when you do have um, um, just any disease, but especially COVID, you're already naturally gonna just recover. You're not gonna become more active, and you're gonna um, um, you're gonna tend to uh, resort to risky behaviors, um, uh, everything that um, affects stress or you know, viewing more screen time and um, eating more sweets like for your diet. And obviously that's gonna play a role in obesity. And on uh, this chart here, I just wanted to put this here in terms of for uh, hospital stays related to COVID. As you can see, if you look in the center here, you compare it with all the other uh, conditions out there, obesity tends to, uh, um, um, have the highest numbers in terms of people who are um, staying um, staying in the hospital um, being infected with uh, with COVID. Um, most of the people are, are are suffering from obesity in comparison to all the other high numbers in terms of for the chronic um, diseases at hand. Then um, then we just take a deeper dive into just mental health, just how um, and I'm pretty sure we all can mentally uh, relate to this. Just how. COVID-19 has related to our mental health. I mean, just taking the whole exercise component out of it, you know, how it affected a lot, a lot of us financially, how, how it created more economical uh, problems for all of us, how it affected our, our levels of sleep and, and just how, um, you know, more screen time, more time on social media, you know, all this affects mental health, but then you um, add COVID to it, it's just, again, it's gonna magnify you know, the variables um, below, uh, anxiety and depression and, and stress. And those three factors right there, they, they um, very relate like to, to each other. If you are depressed, you're going to tend to have a, um, a high level of anxiety and stress. Then um, on here, if you look at here, this is kind of like the role with um, depression. As you can see the factors, you know, you can see it occurs in a cyclic um, um, fashion. But what's really interesting here, if you look at the, at the bottom, you know, yes, passive sedentary behaviors, um, you know, time that you're not engaging and being active or exercising, yes, it's going to cause these downward uh, factors uh, that is going to not only lead to more chronic disease, you know, but definitely mental health. But if you look to the right, um, it shows that if you start engaging and just being active, moder moderately uh, physically active, just uh, moving around. You know, you can start to reverse some of these um, uh, factors that that plays in, especially uh, as it relates to some of these other diseases. You know, um, you know, you look at diabetes and a uh, metabolic syndrome and uh, cardiovascular disease. Like these are um, uh, these are um, modifiable diseases where you know just by changing your lifestyle, you influence the outcome. Like for those uh, given conditions. And just like right here, um, if you just look at the social confinement, well, um, two big things happened during the COVID. Not only our physical activity levels went down, our sedentary um, activity went up. I'll give you an example. Like for example, for me, I'm somebody who goes to the gym all the time. My main, my main time of being active is working out in the gym. 
where you had the lockdown to it, just by default, I lost that time of being physically inactive. Um, or, yeah, or phys physically active. And, and, um, and especially in the lockdown at home, by default, I'm just sitting around and doing nothing, increasing the sedentary time time and, and, and um, increasing the risk and all those um, previously mentioned issues there. So basically the goal is like when it comes to how much exercise or how much phys uh, physical activity we wanna get, the goal is, is, is um, yes, 150 to 300 minutes um, um, per week, but really the aim is shoot for 150 and you can break this up and do like five days of 30 minutes of just simply moving around. And when, when I'm saying moving around, Avoid, uh, avoid uh, long periods of laying down and sitting down in a chair. I look at that as, you know, if you're avoiding those two things, you're in the green zone. You're being active, you're moving around. And if you look at these benefits right here, these are the benefits of how it, uh, of how it um, improves you directly related to, to COVID. And then you, can, uh, then you can break it down to different types of activity. You, know, you don't always have to go to the gym to work out. You can do things at at home, you know, uh, one of the one of the big things, of course, with the lockdown, um, not only people couldn't go to the gym, but um, people lost their ability to get access to uh, to the equipment that maybe they were used, used to doing. And then, you know, you have places like Amazon and everything. You know, the, because the demand was so high, which that's a good problem. But again, it's, it kind of defeats its purpose because you know we we rent. You know, a lot of these places. Would run out of kettlebells, dumbbells, um, I mean, you you name it, you know, um, and you know, um, and, and it shows like you don't have to have like those pieces of equipment. You can use things around the house. You can use laundry detergent bottles. You can use milk containers. Um, you know, you can use your chair and things like that to get the same similar uh, benefits for being uh, um, for, for getting active. And the big thing is, um, especially you know, living in Florida or, or places like that, you, like, like just by getting outside, you're already being active. Because if, if you think about it, you got to get back in, in the house. So, hey, you're being active right there. And in, in the whole mission, kind of like what I said is, you know, try to break it down to 30 minutes, five, five days a week, bam, you hit your 150 minutes like for the week. And it just shows you, these are different ways of, of how you can do it. You can clean, clean um, around your house. You know, like maybe if you are working, maybe you're just walking around instead of sitting down at, at a desk. Um, just by maybe getting out of your seat every 30 minutes or so, long term wise, you're already producing enough um, um, health term benefits in terms of avoiding the effects of sedentary activity. And this, um, and this chart here just kind of separates the immediate and long term effects of the exercise. I'm not going to dive into them. But one of the big things what a lot of people do when it comes to, um, you, know, you know, goal setting with a lot of the um, patients or just people that I work with um, in a group fitness setting, um, that the goals that they're trying to do is more closer to the long-term effects of exercise. You know, they, they want to improve their heart health or they want to lose weight, especially, or they want to improve their bone strength. Um, but a lot of people neglect that, you know, just the immediate effects that you get from exercise. Just one bout of moderate to uh, vigorous physical activity provides the benefit of, of getting more quality sleep. Hey, that's that's benefit to mental health right there. Less anxiety, same thing right there. And also just even blood pressure. You're even you're getting cardiovascular benefit by getting a, a post-hypotensive effect from, from exercise. And, and this is just with one bout of exercise. And I put this chart here that just kind of shows uh, just even with walking, um, uh, I meet a lot of people who, uh, who think like walking is a waste, a, like a waste of time. Like, you know, you know like I'm not gonna get enough benefit from walking. You know, but as you can see, you know, just by spending more time walking, you know, you get a cascade of different uh, benefits uh, such as improving your energy levels, uh, um, elevating your, your metabolism, you know, improving oxygen to your, to your, uh, to your cells. And, um, of your body and and also you're having a, a cognitive benefit of just thinking thinking clearly i'm going to be honest when i gave before i um giving this presentation i went for a little walk to to ease my nerves <laughs> then they, we break it down to uh, even resistance training and i just i put this up because um you know there's a big percentage of people out there that just think like oh resistance training is this you know it's, it's just used for to gain muscles but no it's, it's used for 
um, the benefits go beyond that. You know, um, it, it goes for good um, glucose uptake. So those people who are having, um, you know, issues with um, or who, who are like pre-diabetic, for example, resistance training is one of the best things you can do because um, you, you're able to uptake the, the sugars better just naturally by just um, by the strength training. You have um, a neuromuscular benefit in terms of um, improving your coordination because when you do strength training, you are moving your entire body and you know, you're, you're uh, addressing a lot of these other uh, key conditions as you can see. And this chart right here, just kind of shows like, um, you know, different pieces of equipment that people can use for their home equipment. You know, uh, now that because more people, you know, they're working telehealth or they're, um, they're not having to go to the work as much or they refuse to go back to a gym, which again, that kind of presents an extra barrier right there. Um, I thought this little handout right here, this kind of discusses the pros and cons of using each of the different pieces of equipment. So as you can see, um, you know, like kettlebells, for example, um, the skill is, is, um, um, is required for it, but the cost is low, you know, um, in comparison to, you know, weight training machine, you know, kind of shows, hey, the cost is very, very high, but, you know, the skill is relatively easy. And most of these uh, equipment are versatile where you can use it for many, many different things. Um, so great chart right there. So then the, the thing about uh, what I really appreciate about the um, telehealth services is one of the big things that came emergent, especially during the pandemic. And, and one of the things that I can attest to, and I'm pretty sure along with other people and a lot, a lot of the other providers out there, it allowed me to get my job back because there's one point when um, the pandemic got so bad, I was furloughed for about um, three or four months. But when I switched to health, telehealth, not only allowed me to get my job, but it allowed me to keep the community healthy. So just one of the two big uh, positives I, I really appreciate uh, with this. And um, this little sample sheet is just kind of like an example that I give out to a lot of people is from the American College of Sports Medicine. They, um, I attach links at the end, uh, which I'll go over here in a, in, in a moment. But uh, this is like just a sample workout that I uh, give to a lot of people, it just takes seven minutes to do and you can do it at home. You don't need any pieces of equipment, but it's something you can find on their, on their website. And on, on this, uh, this little uh, sheet right here is a great sheet for the children. Um, and I guess even the adults uh, too, but it's from the American Heart Association. It just shows like, you know, just 25 easy ways of how um, you can get active, of how you can not only make exercise easy, but you can make it uh, fun. And one of the things I can really appreciate uh, from these big organizations, obviously the American College of Sports Medicine, but the CDC, the World Health Organization, American Heart Association, they're providing a lot of great resources out there to the public of like, of where, how you can make all of these things much easier to do. And just like really the big takeaways, um, you know, I just want to want to um, give is, you know, is you know, number one, we've came a long way with technology, you know, fitness is, well, that's what we're doing, but, you know, um, you know, take advantage of it, you know, I mean, I know, like, technology is, can be viewed as, you know, kind of bad and kind of makes us more sedentary in ways, um, won't go, go into there, but at, um, but, for example, the telehealth has really, really helped a lot, a lot of us out in this, in this um, past, uh, in this recent uh, year or so. Um, number two, fitness is always evolving. So when, you know, when there's a pandemic, fitness is going to find a way to, to come to you to, to keep you healthy and strong. And three, this is like uh, one of my big ones right here. You, you're more, the, you're more resilient than, than you, uh, than you really think you are. You know, the fact that you're here right now, um, listening to us speak, um, you know, you're, you're here, you, um, you didn't let all those other previously mentioned issues um, become too over overwhelming, you're still here and, uh, and your bodies are a lot stronger than, than you think. Give, you, give yourself credit, give yourself a pat on, on the back. And, and this comes up, uh, comes to my uh, fourth one, just have fun. At the end of the day, when you exercise, it's like your own art. It's, it's your own version of, of, of you. Um, don't make it burdensome. Don't make it very um, um, overwhelming for yourself. Um, Make it unique to you, uh, do your own thing with it. And, and, and when you think of it in that sense, it really becomes much, uh, much easier in the long run. So thank you everybody for listening.
Oh, Thank yeah. you so much, Chris. So inspirational as have all our presenters been tonight. And uh, guess what? It's time to begin the Q&A session. So we're all gonna be on screen here in a minute. So all of our experts are ready to tackle them. Remember, you still can ask questions of our experts using the Q&A function in your Zoom webinar toolbar. A lot of you actually have been engaging with our experts tonight directly, and they've answered some of your questions, which are personal and so forth, and you've really gotten a lot out of it. It's quite a privilege. So let's go with our first question. We've spent too much time inside the house during the pandemic and eat out of anxiety or boredom. I know that you touched upon some of this before, but how do you deal with this? And whoever wants to go first, take it away. Um, thank you so much, um, Iana. Yes, actually the anxiety is a big part of it and the depression as well and the stress. So what we have to do is first of all, I will encourage everyone just to practice the deep breathing relaxation exercise, okay? This is one of my favorites, let me, if I may, and I know that perhaps we are thinking, no, we don't have enough time, uh, or we have to run, we have to do this stuff, you know. So just try to calm down and to practice the breathing exercise. You see, our brain is like a little computer. Everything that we hear, everything that we see, it gets recorded. So it's about reprogramming, if you may want to use that word, our brain into just calm down first, okay? So that's the whole thing. And this is, if I may, I can, I would like to, to provide an example because we, right now we're talking, we're bringing, however, we're not making like a, a huge effort. And again, to kind of uh, reprogram that brain of ours and make a deep breathing exercise, okay? Why? Because that will be decreasing those cortisol levels that are very, very high whenever we are stressed or anxious, we have to calm those down. We have to decrease those. So how do we do that? By providing this breathing exercise. Again, we're breathing with the diaphragm. The diaphragm is like a little parachute, okay? So it will help us to just fill those uh, lungs with air. So this is the way how I do it. And you know, I would love to teach you guys today. So something extremely important, a key is to just close the eyes whenever you need to take your break and to take a deep breath. So closing the eyes, taking a deep breath in through the nose. And this is only gonna take us like one second. And then release it, hold it for four seconds and then release it and slowly through your mouth. Okay, so let me go ahead. And the whole thing, of, I always ask my patients to put one hand on the chest and the other one in the belly. Why? Because remember the brain got connection. So we got to go ahead and remind ourselves about that. It's about like when we're learning a new, uh, you know, a new language or when we are learning to play an instrument. So again, it go, all goes back to the, you know, breathing and relaxation. So putting one hand on the chest and the other one in the belly. When we're breathing into the nose, we're going to hold it for four seconds only. And then we're going to release the air out through the mouth. And we're gonna feel how the belly expands on the outside, okay? Some of my patients reported that once they release the air out through the mouth, the belly kind of goes in. So whatever works best for you, okay? So this is about discovering yourself, discovering your body, and you start implementing the strategies that we can do. So again, I'm gonna close the eyes. I'm gonna take a deep breath in through the nose, hold it for four, release. One, two, three. I'm gonna hold it for four. One, two, three, four, and release it slowly. You see? And that's something very, very easy that we all can do. I encourage everyone, again, whenever you feel stressed, worried, or, or just too anxious, to go ahead and immediately redirect those thoughts, the brain, into the breathing. Try to practice it for at least five to 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, the more, the better. Yeah, that's a great tip. And uh, a lot of us in exercise and yoga and Pilates and a lot of the slow types of exercise routines, we try and do that because breathing is everything. And, and Chris is nodding saying, absolutely it is. Dr. Pearl, <laughs> how, how about this one? How can I train myself not to snack between meals? So I think the biggest thing is asking yourself whether or not you're truly hungry. Like I mentioned before, a lot of people confuse hunger with thirst, boredom, anxiety, stress, you name it. We like to eat because it uh, literally changes our brain chemistry. And the snacks that often people go to are either the really sweet stuff, like the cookies, or it's the savory stuff that have a ton of salt. And so all that salt, all that sugar, particularly things with high fructose corn syrup, 
literally change our brain chemistry and make us crave more. It's a true phenomenon that we can't just have one chip because of all that sodium. And then with all that sodium, it triggers thirst. And then we go off and go and grab that soda. So I think the first thing is really trying to understand, is it true hunger for food or is it hunger for something else? So I always tell people, at least start with making sure that you're hydrated. So bink, uh, drink a big glass of water. Um, another thing is keeping your home a safe place. So now that many of us are at home more often, every time we walk by the pantry, it becomes this inner turmoil with ourselves. Should I open the cabinet? Should I not? We're constantly looking in there for something. So get the junk out of the home. If you want the chips, if you want the cookie, you can have it. As long as you leave your home, you go get one serving, but you do not bring it back into your safe place. So really kind of setting up that environment so that it makes it easier. If you're craving something sweet, then going for something that gives you natural sugar. So grabbing an apple and maybe having it with some plain peanut butter, that will help give you that sweet flavor, get rid of the craving, but also gives you fiber and a lot of nutrients that will keep you full longer. Yeah, and I saw that you answered directly to uh, some of the people in the Q&A about artificial sweeteners and how we think that that really uh, helps us. And in fact, it actually creates more cravings. Yeah, absolutely. The diet food industry is a billion dollar industry. So what I tell people all the time is if all these products were actually doing good, we wouldn't have more chronic illness. We wouldn't have more obesity today than we've ever had. We actually give animals artificial sweeteners because it's a cheaper alternative to sugar and it promotes weight gain. Yet we market it to humans for weight loss. So it really just doesn't make sense. It increases cravings. It affects your satiety hormones. So you end up actually unconsciously eating more. So in general, you want to get rid of the sweeteners. And if you're, again, you're craving something sweet, you go for your natural sugar, like a fruit. Perfect. Cause that was well, uh, the, the next question, but you took care of it. So Chris, let me tee this one up for you. I sit in front of a computer for 12 to 14 hours a day. How can I motivate myself to move more and still address the other priorities in my life? No, that's a great question. So, you know, again, coming back to the uh, technology um, um, aspect of it, you know, um, even though it, you know, it, it can slow us down, it can, it, it can also um, uh, help you in ways too. So if you are sitting down, um, um, at a computer all day and you're, you're, um, uh, completely occupied with work or just other priorities, you know, um, um, you can, you can take little breaks here and there, um, and, and watch different, uh, movement, um, exercise uh, videos, whether they're on, um, YouTube or whether it's, um, if you go on, um, um, Beach, beachbody.com or, 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 or fitness blender. I'm just throwing some uh, different uh, random examples out there. And what I really, really like about uh, some of the, um, the exercise classes, like on YouTube, you can actually type in um, specifics, seven minute workout, um, um, five minute boot camp workout. And, you, and you'll be surprised. You'll get some things that come on, but I will caution that. Just make sure that, you know, of course you approach anything with, with caution, you know, know your limits. Um, and, and, um, and another, um, a great option too, is, uh, you know, they're talking about exercise snacks, you know, so, um, even though you're sitting at a computer all day, day, for example, uh, you still have to get up and go to the bathroom or you have to get up and go to the, uh, refrigerator and grab that snack. Maybe when you, uh, when you, when you, when you do little simple tasks like that, you just, do little exercise moments. Like every time when I go to the bathroom, I'm going to do uh, five body weight squats. Or every time I go to the re refrigerator, you know, I'm going to do 10 arm reaches, you know, maybe that doesn't do anything right now, but when you add this in the long term, it makes a huge difference. And, and surprisingly, when you start adding these little micro, um, micro bouts of activity, it does have a, have an effect on one's self-efficacy level. So when it, when it, when it comes to their belief of actually like, you know, I think this is not only I can do it, but I can make this more manageable for myself. And it kind of builds uh, from there. So um, those are, you know, two good ideas I would recommend. Yeah. And Dr. Perlman also answered a, a direct question with people asking about the type of equipment. And she's like, resistance bands. You, there's so much you can do with resistance bands at home. And, and so here's another question for you, Chris. And that is what types of exercises can this person do 
uh, he or she needs the assistance of a cane to walk and stand upright. So some uh, ability issues uh, physically. What, what advice on that one? No, great question. I mean, the biggest thing is, I mean, especially if they have to use some type of assistive uh, device, you know, of course, they, uh, number one, they definitely do need, um, they should get clearance from their, from the doctor, of course, to see if, it, if, it, if they can safely do exercises or not just that, but just understand what they're restricted on. So if they're using a, a cane, you know, um, the biggest thing is we don't want to make uh, the issue much worse. So if they're restricted with uh, moving around with the, with the cane, maybe, I'm not saying they can, but maybe they can do things in a chair. Maybe they, they can do things um, on the bed or, or, or the floor. You know, maybe they can do things um, in, in the pool. So like depending on what, you know, all those, um, what, what the different physical limitations are, assuming it's not too much, um, they, can, they can work around those, um, those uh, different um, issues. And, um, and I'll say if they are using a, a cane, um, and maybe they are not exercising at all. Um, maybe a good starting point is doing um, some of the different like popular uh, chair fitness uh, classes. Um, the great thing I really love about in this day and age, uh, um, a lot of exercise professionals have learned to really expand upon the different um, exercise varieties, like, uh, um, you know, maybe being in a seated position, like there's cardio exercises you can do in a chair. There's, of course, strength training. There's even chair yoga, um, you know, balance um, exercises you can do in a chair. And, you know, maybe as a long-term goal, uh, hopefully where uh, assuming the person does positively benefit a uh, benefit um, um, from those, you know, type of exercises, maybe they're strong enough where they don't have to use the cane anymore. So it's kind of like one of the, it's like the crawl before you walk type of phenomenon. Yeah, that's, that's good advice, Chris. Uh, and so many of you are continuing to ask questions and, and our experts are uh, working fast and furious to answer them directly. Uh, but here's one that I think is, is interesting and that is cheap food or fast food. The, and this person asks and says he's a meat and potatoes kind of guy with not a big budget. So they compare diet food to, to expensive food and, and he has a, a, a limited budget. What advice do you have on that, Dr. Perlman, perhaps? So there's nothing inherently wrong with meat and potatoes, but there's something inherently wrong with too much meat and too much potatoes and, and the type of meat. So if you see a lot of marbling and it's dripping in fat, it's probably not the best type of meat. If you're a red meat type of person, then maybe going for a leaner cut would be a better option, like a tenderloin. The potatoes are fine. There's a lot of nutrients, particularly ones like sweet potatoes or purple potatoes. Um, but again, you can't have three huge potatoes because it still has a lot of carbohydrates. So keeping to a portion, but then realizing that when you add all the extra stuff to it, like a loaded baked potato at a steak restaurant, you just went from a decent side, just a, let's say a roasted um, potato to something that has a ton of salt, a ton of saturated fat and a ton of calories. So there's nothing inherently wrong with the meat and potatoes, but the problem is, is all the junk we put on top of it, the marinades, the extra salt, the gravy, the sour cream, all of that stuff adds up. I know a lot of people kind of have this idea that cheap food um, is, you know, or, or quality food is a lot more expensive. But if you actually look at the nutrient density, you're getting a lot of calories, but you're getting empty calories with cheap food versus if you have like fruits or vegetables or nuts or seeds, although it may be a little bit more expensive, um, it actually has a lot more nutrients. So you're getting a lot more bang for your buck. I always tell people um, your health is your wealth. You either invest in your health now or you're going to invest in your sickness later. So it really just depends on where you want to spend that money. If you want to spend the money or you prefer spending the money on cheap junk food now, you'll end up probably using that money that you saved on health care later. Uh, we're obviously running a little over because it's fascinating and so many people are engaged and, and want the answer. So let's go around the room and I'm going to throw a bunch of, of different topics out that are very much on the top of the mind of the people asking. What's the optimal time of day to exercise? One would say the time that you have available, right? How about alcohol calories being empty calories? How about intermittent fasting? And how about the value and power of water? Take it away. 
I guess I'll start oh, off. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I was going to say, as far as um, um, for the, uh, for the um, exercise part, um, definitely um, time is definitely the key factor. But if you had to pick one, um, research shows that uh, um, mornings typically work better um, because, um, you know, um, typically the individual is already well rested. Um, they're, for example, their growth hormone levels um, um, is, is at its highest in the mornings uh, after a good night's uh, sleep. So people tend to um, tend to do better in the in the mornings uh, from a from a health perspective, um, but nothing to take away from the from the evening. Um, but if you had to pick one, I would say it's better to do it early or just in the morning compared to the evening. Dr. Perlman, talk about intermittent fasting. Some people believe in it, swear that it keeps them healthy. Do you believe in it? Is it good for us? Yeah, so it totally depends on the person. Um, I think when we're taught as children that we have to eat breakfast, it's the most important meal of the day. Breakfast is breaking the fast. So whatever time of the day that is for you, whether it's 7 a.m., 11 a.m., or 2 p.m., that's your breakfast or breaking the fast. Um, I, write, I really try to teach people to eat when they're hungry, but it really depends on what your schedule is. So for instance, if I'm going to be doing procedures all day, um, then I will probably eat breakfast because I know I, I may not have a chance to eat until 4 p.m. And then I'm starving and then I'm likely to overeat. And then I don't want to eat 2000 calories right before I go to bed. So it's depending on your schedule. Um, so, so intermittent fasting works for some people. If you tend to be hungry in the morning, then I'm for sure not going to tell you to starve all day. And then you're battling with the hunger and then you, you know, and then I tell you to eat at 2 PM in general, though, we shouldn't be eating right before bed. Even if you're laying down to watch TV, you don't want to eat or drink a whole lot within three hours of going to bed. Whatever you just ate is now sitting in your stomach. And if you lie down or go to bed, it's now more likely to reflux up. So depending on your schedule, your hunger levels, um, what you tend to prefer, again, you don't have to have breakfast. You just don't want to eat very late at night. And, and then from there, it's really just tailored to the individual person. Yeah. Flora Beth, I'm going to let you sort of take us home with this one. And that is, yes, we all know the power of water. We need a lot of water. We need to stay hydrated during the day, but really talk to us about the power of the mind. The fact that we have control over how we feel, how we control our feelings and everything else. Please. Absolutely. My pleasure. You see the brain, the mind, it's just very, very important here. We just have to take care of it. As a matter of fact, the brain is made out of water as well. So we have to incorporate drinking water and also doing any of the relaxation exercises to help the brain to also develop, you know, all of the nutrients and all of the, the chemicals, the healthy chemicals that we need to have in here. So it's extremely important for us to just, again, make the pause, take our time and be gentle with ourselves. Like Chris was mentioning, all of you guys are very strong and resilient. So please, Give yourselves uh, credit for that and, and enjoy and uh, have fun. Like, you know, in terms of the water, let me go ahead and, and show you guys. I try, I know that the permanent mentioned it, it has to be like at least 64 ounces of water, which is hard. So, you know, I try to, I like this bottle because, you know, it measures how much water I'm drinking through the day. So, you know, just to make it a habit, okay? Like you see like the breathing, uh, taking care of ourselves, relax, drinking water, eating healthy, mindfulness eating, all of those require for us to just to be more, you know, little by little taking it one day at a time, not to be rushing, but on the time that you're about to go ahead and, and think, oh my gosh, let me get home, I wanted to eat something. Just remember the word stop, okay? Like the power of the mind, visualization. When you guys see the stop sign, okay? What is the shape of that stop sign? It has how many sides? Is made out of how many sides? Six or eight? Let's see if you guys remember. But my point is that we have to just stop, okay? The stop sign says stop. So just go ahead and remind yourself, visualize in your brain the stop sign that you need to stop right there. Give yourself five, 10 minutes, do the breathing. And after that, think about it. Okay, am I still hungry or am I just, you know, I need to do something else. So. And then the other thing that I'd like to remind everyone, and I know all of you can weigh in and say, yes, telehealth is available. 
Yes, it is. We will tell you how to connect with that. I myself did many a Matt Pilates class in that first year <laughs> of the pandemic, as all of us did with that computer screen. So yes, it's available. Uh, check the, the end of our screen so you know how to contact everybody. But uh, unfortunately, we've come to an end. We went a little over because we had to. But we want to thank our incredible, attentive audience for their participation. And of course, to our experts who were phenomenal, Dr. Perlman, Flora Beth, Chris, uh, expert advice, inspirational advice, and thank you for taking the time after a very long and busy day, because we at the University of Miami Health System appreciate you, we're here to care for you, and we invite you to please visit umiamihealth.org to learn more about our programs. Hope you enjoyed tonight's U Miami Health Talk. Yes, there will be a, a link with video of all the recording. Stay well, everyone. Stay safe. Good night.